you guys ready to do this? We're going to talk about hormones today. And we're going to talk about, um, I'm going to show you and explain to you how your hormones actually talk to you. <laughs> they, because remember, hormone from first day, hormones are messengers. They are, they deliver a message. That's what they do, right? So they just come, they deliver it to a cell or organs or whatever, like, hey, this is happening, do this. That's what hormones do. And they deliver messages to you all the time. I want you to start to take notice to what they're saying to you. So we're going to go through that part. And then I know I've had people ask me, like, when it comes to, to testing, like, how do you do that? What do you recommend? I'm going to show you the lab work that I have my clients get. Um, and if you guys want to write it down or screenshot it at that point, you guys can. Um, and, and, and we'll go from there and we'll open it up. But I'm going to pull up this. Here we go. Okay, hopefully you guys, we can all see this. Yes, yes. Okay. All right, so um, we're going to talk about speaking hormones today. Understanding what your hormones are trying to tell you before you ever spend a dime on lab work. And I will say that the majority of my clients, when they start with me, if they want to get lab testing and they have the extra money to invest in it and they like to see the changes in the, in the values, um, then we could get some lab work done or if they have lab work all evaluated at that point. Um, but for me, if you remember those, those foundational four are what I care about most, because what you'll find is that when you take care of those four, everything upstream starts to fall in place. And I'm always hesitant to say this, but it is the truth is that it is not uncommon for women who come to me who are in perimenopause and maybe haven't had a period in a while or it's super erratic. Um, once we get those four in place, all of a sudden they start having a regular period. I, I know that oh, some of us, when you're in perimenopause, you just want it to be over. So I'm always a little hesitant to say that. But having a regular cycle like that is a signal of a healthy metabolism. So it isn't uncommon for everything else to kind of fall in place once you get those four kind of like solid and, and, and balanced out. So here's how, how we do this. And this is an acronym that I learned from one of my mentors, uh, one of my first mentors years ago. Um, his name is Dr. Jay Tita. He is a naturopath. Um, he, he does a lot more um, uh, mindset work now, he, um, but he is an amazing doctor when it comes to metabolism. Um, and he created this acronym SHMEC. Is your SHMEC in check? Um, I later added the D on there to add the digestion in then. So these are just some, just a handful of biofeedback markers that your body will give you telling you whether or not you are in balance. So basically you would take each one of these and you would rate them on a scale from one to five. One meaning I'm having really bad symptoms and five meaning not no symptoms, but manageable. And I'll walk you through each one. And what I would recommend you guys do is as we're going through this, rate yourself. And then we can talk about like, okay, where's this at? And then I'm gonna show, I'm gonna tell you like how to balance some of these out. Um, the first one is sleep. So a one would be, <laughs> I have a hard time going to sleep. I don't stay asleep. When I wake up in the middle of the night, I have a hard time going back to sleep and I wake up tired. That's a one. A five is I, I go to sleep pretty easily. I don't generally wake up at night. If I do, it's because I have to go to the bathroom, but I can go back to sleep pretty easily. And I feel pretty rested when I wake up. So rate yourself one through five. Give yourself a one through five on that. Now let's go to hunger. A one is <laughs> I think about food all day. <laughs> like I'm just, it's like, I just feel like I'm always hungry. Like I'm always like, oh, I'm ready to eat again, right? That's a one. Um, and even when I eat, I feel like I could eat more. Like, like I could, just, like I, a normal size meal just really doesn't do it. I just kind of always want something else. Different from cravings, we're gonna get to cravings. Um, a five does not mean you never get hungry. A five means I get hungry at meal times. It's like not something that I really think of unless I'm getting close to meals where I'm like, oh, I think I'm starting to get hungry. I'm probably gonna need to eat in the next hour. That's kind of a five. So it's not no hunger, it's managed hunger right? So rate yourself one to five on that. Mood. One, if you're in perimenopause, you probably can relate. 
One means I was swinging from crying. I was, I posted something on social media um, last week. I, I was like all kinds of crazy on the, on the um, hormonal dysfunction. I, I can tell you guys like why later, but um, I essentially had um, no period for three months and then two periods within three weeks. It was a good time. Um, so my, my, all of these were all kinds of scurry. But I remember I went for a walk and I heard a country song and it made me cry. I cried for like three minutes. I couldn't stop crying. Um, so you swing from like being very emotional, like crying and just sad to like rage that like where they, things happen and you know it's over the top rage. <laughs> You're fully aware <laughs> that if you speak or say something, it's going to end badly, right? Like you swing from that. Um a five doesn't mean that you don't have emotions or that you don't get upset or that you don't get agitated. There are external sources that can sometimes throw us off, but that's the difference is that it's like not over the top or you feel like it's happening to you. It's just like, no, sometimes you get irritable. People do dumb stuff. Um, that would be a five. So rate yourself one to five. Um, energy levels. One is I wake up tired. <laughs> I like coffee, whatever to kind of get, get me going through the day. And I'm just trying to get to nighttime. And then at night, I'm like, try to go to bed. I'm like, oh, I just need to go to bed. But then I get this weird kick up. Like maybe, maybe you get this weird kick up right before you're trying to go to sleep. And now you're like, okay, well, now I'm wide awake. Right. And it's just these really weird cycles. Um, a five energy wise is like, I wake up feeling pretty rested. A five is not like I just did crack cocaine. That's not what it means. It means my energy levels are pretty stable through the day. I'm not noticing big peaks or big drops. I just feel like I have pretty even energy throughout the day. So rate yourself one to five on that. Cravings different from hunger and how you can distinguish from the, the two is, is I always tell my clients like, ask yourself, would you eat chicken and broccoli? Like if, if you were hungry, would you eat more chicken? <laughs> would you eat more vegetables? A craving is like, well, I want, I want like chocolate. I need something salty or I need crunchy, like that certain mouthfeel, right? That's a craving. So a one is I crave stuff almost all day, every day. Like I'm just always having to avoid sugar or salt, like, or I switch back and forth. Like one minute I need sugar and then I need salt. Like it's just, it, it's overpowering, right? A five doesn't mean you don't have cravings. We all have cravings, right? But a five means, I don't really notice them, they kind of crop up, and usually I can either ignore them for a few minutes, or I can give it like a little snack, and it's fine. So like, I have chocolate every day, right? Sometimes it's a little piece of chocolate, sometimes it's like maybe a little, um, I do like these zucchini chocolate muffins, I'll do those, um, or paleo muffins or something, you know. If I do something small and it satisfies it, it's a win, right? So that's still a five. It doesn't mean they don't exist. It just means they're not ruining and running your life. And then digestion, a one is, oh, I'm supposed to be pooping every day. I only go to the bathroom. I only have a bowel movement every like every two, three days, right? Um, or if it is from a consistency standpoint, FYI, if, we, if you do choose to continue working with me ongoing, we talk about your poop. So I'm just telling you that now. Um, consistency standpoint, it's either leaning more towards constipation where it's hard or more loose, too loose. Right. So we want that kind of like a five would be I have at least one bowel movement every day, not more than three. And they're not either too loose or too hard. That would be a five. So I'm going to leave it up for just a second. Go through, put schmecked, and then put your number next to each one. Here's the thing. Balanced hormones, because they're going to fluctuate, right? You want to be a four or five. If you're at a four or five on, on all of these, you're doing pretty good. That's the goal. If you're a one through three, that tells you that that's what you need to work on. And if sleep is one of those things, it needs to come first because it affects the other ones. <laughs> so solve for sleep. And we'll give you some, some tips on how to do that as well. Make sure there's no questions. Okay. If you guys have questions as we go, go ahead and, and feel free to drop them in. Any revelations on this in the chat, you guys can drop it in the chat. You may want to share ones that, that are like one to three that they're that they notice. All right, we're gonna keep going. All right, 
so how do you fix it? What are the strategies for, for regaining some balance? And again, balance we use loosely optimized hormones. They're never in this perfect spot, but we want them kind of fairly balanced so that they're working together with each other and that they are um, helping your metabolism operate the way that it needs to. So when it comes to nutrition, how do we re how do we balance this out? It goes back to your nutrition big three, right? So we're looking at, are you getting enough water? For water, we want to make sure that we have enough um, electrolytes so that we're absorbing the water in. A good rule of thumb is half your body weight in ounces, and then, you know, play with it based on environment, um, activity level, things like that. So that's your first one. Second one is going to be protein, right? Because protein is your most satiating hormone. It's also going to help with blood sugar regulation. So we want to make sure that we're getting enough protein. And then we want to make sure we're getting enough fiber. Fiber is going to be 25 to 35 grams. Again, with both of those, make sure you're working your way up. So you're not, um, making your digestive system work too hard, but that's going to be your nutrition big three. And I will tell you that anytime somebody gets off, these are the first three that we look at. They are your foundations because they have the biggest impact. So it's like, okay, like do you, are these, um, are these balanced out? And when it comes to like, you'll notice I put sleep in here too. Um, if your nutrition is not balanced, and I think I'll go into this here in just a little bit, your if you, this happens a lot. If you are someone who has eliminated your carbohydrates for dinner, but you are waking up between two and four and having a hard time going back to sleep, that means that you're getting a cortisol awakening response. And the reason that that happens is that if your blood sugar drops too low, cortisol will come up to raise um, blood sugar back up, right? But when cortisol rises, you're awake. It wakes you up. So we want to make sure that that nutrition is balanced. I do not have anybody not eating carbs for dinner because you need that time carbs actually lower cortisol so we want to make sure that we're getting the just right amount of those so that's how we do it with the nutrition big three when it comes to properly fueling so for most women that come to me they're going to fall into one of two camps they're either going to fall into what's called um, metabolic syndrome where somewhere along the line um, they're in some kind of metabolic distress and, and metabolic syndrome by definition is going to be created by an overabundance of energy intake of energy. And that means either through calories or through carbohydrates. It means that their, their system is getting more energy over time chronically than is being used. So this is typically going to be somebody who is more of a couch potato who ends up eating either too much food or leans more into starchy carbohydrates that don't have a lot of nutrients in them. Um, and that can create metabolic syndrome. So there's that camp. And then you have the, the camp where we talked about metabolic adaptation, where if you are not getting enough fuel chronically over time, your metabolism down regulates. And so now you have a slower metabolism. We want to make sure to create that balance that we are properly fueling. It's that Goldilocks zone, right? Not too little, not too much, but just that right spot where the body's getting what it needs. Um, and FYI, the, the metabolism will either, it likes either maybe a smaller deficit and you could extend that for a longer period of time that doesn't feel too, um, too threatening to it, or <laughs> you can do a deeper deficit for a short amount of time um, and, and it typically won't give you a lot of uh, feedback or pushback as long as these are already balanced out. Um, and there's, there's more than one way to do a deficit guys. I think we go into that on the last day. Um, so you want to make sure you're properly fueling, and then you want to make sure that you have enough restorative time and you have some sort of stress management. And this <laughs> for me was the hardest part. Um, especially as I moved into perimenopause and along that line I'm still in perimenopause um, at 52 it's not a good time I wish I was over it but we're still here right and so it's just a time where those hormones are fluctuating a lot and it just creates a lot of stress on the system and being someone who's very ambitious and loves to go and loves to do things it's really it really took me hitting perimenopause for for me to go okay you need to take this seriously <laughs> instead of just like going 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 I went from working out five days a week and now I do I went down to like nothing for a while and then I've worked my way back up to three to four but I've had to revamp how I do it um, and I've also had to work in stress management practices so th things like that are literally just leisure time 
It could be during the day. It could be at night. For me, leisure time is going to be typically before I go to bed. I've created a bedtime routine that really, really works. Um, what about postmenopause? Do these things apply? So the question is, um, guys in the chat, Francesca, Francesca wants to know, what about postmenopause? Do these things apply? In menopause or postmenopause, basically it's not as volatile. So all the hormones have dropped off. So you still are going to be, um, hormone deficient and things like estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, things like that, which are important. And those can affect other systems. The difference in perimenopause is that things like progesterone and, and testosterone are starting to drop off, but estrogen doesn't just drop like this. She she pings, she fights it. She's a fighter, right? So she's going to be like high and low and over here. And that's the swing. That's that mood swing, right? So these are dropping off and you got to remember your progesterone is your calming hormone, the one that helps you sleep. So as that's dropping off, your anxiety goes up, your sleep gets more disrupted. And then you've got this girl over here causing all kinds of craziness because she can't decide if she wants to be high or low or what's going on. It's a good question. So that is the main difference. Um, hopefully that answers your question, Francesca. Um, okay. So leisure time, laughter. I used to do this all the time. I would just pull up videos and I still do this when I'm just like, oh, I just need to laugh. Like I get up on, on YouTube and I'll find something that makes me laugh. Meditation. I get a lot of feedback on this from my ambitious women. They're like, I can't meditate. And I'm like, that's because you don't understand what meditation is. Meditation is just an awareness. You can train your brain to focus on something. It doesn't mean that you're that you shut your brain off and it's like, you know, quiet. It just means that you're aware of the thoughts and you give it things to focus on. Um, there are different meditations you can use. There are breathing techniques that you can use. Um, one of my favorite breathing techniques is simply making sure that your exhalation is longer than your inhalation. That in itself, because of um, where your diaphragm sits, will slow your heart rate down. And when your heart rate slows down, it sends a signal to your brain like, hey, we need to go into a more restorative state. Um, so just by simply doing that after every workout, I will start to work on my breathing right? Because I do my workout and I got stuff to do, right? So I'm, I'm going, I don't, I don't play around and, and relax. It's like, no, I got to go. So I use breathing to tell my body to go into a more restorative mode. And it's as simple as breathing in to four counts and, and exhaling to five, particularly if you breathe through your mouth, like you're blowing through a straw. The other you can do is a physiological sigh. I do that two or three times a day where you breathe in. And then at the very end, you get like one little more sip of, of air and then you sigh it all out. So it looks like this. That is a physiological sigh. Just told my body to, to go into a more relaxed state and my heart rate is probably dropping back down. Massage, you can go and have a massage or you can massage yourself, right? Like you can do um, mobility. You can get one of those little um, guns, right? That, that massage yourself. You can just, I massage my feet sometimes, right? Or my legs, like you can do that music that makes you happy, uh, mobility, foam rolling, things like that, baths. Um, there is a practice that I do. In fact, I just did it. 30 minutes ago, I do it, I'd say most days that I have a workout and it's called NSDR coined by, um, Dr. Andrew Huberman. I love it. He has a 10 minute version. It's perfect for me. Um, and it's basically using breathing and then also paying attention to, um, sensations in your body. <laughs> and I always tell my clients like, you, and you can find it on YouTube. Um, I always tell my clients, like, you, you want to either sit or lay down. But if you lay down and you have something to do after, make sure you set your timer. I always set my timer for 50 to 20 minutes because most of the time I'm going to fall asleep. And you literally just drop out. Like, you're just like, one minute you're, like, listening to them and you're, like, paying attention. And the next minute you're waking up and you're like, oh, my God, like, what happened? Um, but it helps you hit such a restorative place where you'll wake up and you will be so much more alert. Very, very cool. So you guys can, can look that one up. And then orgasms, by any means necessary, um, orgasms will help create um, calm in your body. Makes your brain calm down. No question so far. Okay. And then let's talk about digestion. Now, keep in mind that um, 
if you guys have ever heard the, the phrase rest and digest, right? When you are in a physiological state of some, some kind of stress, whether it's being created through your brain or it's some kind of physiological stress internally, your body is in called what's called fight or flight. So if you think about it, if you're in fight or flight, your metabolic system is not going to send energy to digestion. Digestion slows. So if you've ever been in that, like, got to eat really quick, right? Like we all do, like, I got things to do, like, and you're just shoving food through, you're not going to digest well because you're in that fight or flight, right? Um, if you eat right after a workout and you haven't calmed your system down, you're going to have a harder, harder time digesting. Um, understand that any kind of chronic stress situation is going to greatly impact your digestion and your gut and your gut matters a lot. It's one of the places that you metabolize. So we want to make sure that that is functioning very well. Um, so when it comes to digestion, the, oh, the other thing is to keep in mind is that as we age, we don't produce as many um, digestive enzymes to help break food down, which is why um, I have them. I don't take them with every meal and I don't even take them every day, but I do typically take digestive enzymes with, with, um, like if I have like a raw, like salads, I will always take a digestive enzyme because my body just has a really hard time breaking down raw veggies. Um, if fat, I have a harder time breaking down fat. Some people have a harder time breaking down protein, right? But that's just going to give you the digestive enzymes to help your body break down and be able to use um, the nutrients that's in that food. So things that you can do, um, I put a little bit of lemon juice in my water first thing in the morning. Um, lemon juice will help. It's kind of a, a natural digestive enzyme, making sure that you chew your food. So digestion actually starts before you put food in the mouth. Um, you get these salivatory responses just from like the smell or the idea of of eating food. And then once you put food in your mouth, you need to make sure you're chewing it enough to break it down so you're not getting big particles in your gut. Um, you wanna make sure that you're getting adequate fiber. You bought both soluble and insoluble fiber. And a good way to make sure that you're getting that is making sure that you're getting not just vegetables, not just fruits, but you're also getting some grains in there. And I see this a lot with women who have cut their carbs down significantly and they've cut out all bread, they've cut out all grains, and they think they're doing a good thing, but then they end up with digestive issues because they're not getting enough fiber. They're only getting one type of fiber and it's not enough. Again, digestive enzymes with your food will help you break that down. HCL has to do with the acid that your body produces. So your body produces acid to help break that food down too. Um, we, we end up not, not creating as much. So there's, there's um, you can Google it. It's called the HCL challenge and it helps you figure out like how much HCL that you actually need. Um, a lot of people mistake that um, acid reflux is having too much acid in most cases, not all, but in most cases, it's actually because you don't have enough acid. Um, and HCL would help you with that. Um, what is the thing with all the bloating? I feel like I'm pregnant. It could be a number of things, Francesca. It's It could be that you just don't have the digestive enzymes. It could be that you aren't breaking down veggies. It could be, it, it could be a number of things. So it really is just a, a matter of figure. It could be stress. It could be stress. Um, there are things that you can do, and this used to happen to me a lot, and it still will happen once in a while, is when I travel, and particularly when I go to see my family in Arizona, usually it's like, they, they live in Arizona, and they live kind of like out in the desert, and so, and they live very, very differently than I do. I love them, and, but it's always very stressful to my system, and so normally, I'll take an early flight, which means that I haven't eaten anything. And then I get off the plane and it's like, ugh, like I'm, tr and I'm trying to get there. And so I'll have these big gaps where I don't eat as much as I normally do. And just simply because I got on a plane and even though I'm eating less food, I also will look like I'm pregnant. And it takes a couple days for my system to just be like, everything's fine. <laughs> you're fine. <laughs> like it's just a flight. So literally it could be numerous things. It's just a matter of figuring out what it is. And over time you kind of just learn like where it's coming from. Um, raw veggies, as I mentioned, um, sometimes a low FODMAP help will help. It's a diet that will remove some of the things that just cause issues in the gut. So we want to make sure that that's not creating an issue. Um, if you are doing all of these things and you need some additional support and you are not going back to the bathroom every day, 
One of the things that you can take is magnesium citrate. There are different forms of magnesium. They all help your body kind of relax and restore on some level, but magnesium citrate is particularly good at digestion if you are constipated. And then there's another form that I will tell you about here in just a second. So that's going to be with digestion. Did that answer your question? I know it's, it's it kind of depends, Francesca. It's kind of hard to know exactly what's going on. Um, and then lastly, sleep. How do you rebalance this out? Well, the first is to have a, a nighttime routine. Um, and I know that for a lot of women, it's like, this is the only time that I get to relax. Right. But you just got to settle in and go, this is important. I need to make sure I'm getting enough sleep. Um, and, and this one was also very hard for me at first, but now it's my favorite time of the day. It's very relaxing. <laughs> I'm, I'm in my bed with my cat and my guy and we're reading. Sometimes we'll massage each other. Sometimes he'll sit behind me and massage my head and my shoulders and it's amazing. And sometimes I do that for him or I rub his head while I read. It's just become a very quiet, calming place for me um, before I go to sleep. And, and combined that with my magnesium glycinate, which you see down there, my cortisol manager, it's lights out. <laughs> I very rarely make it very long. Um, once I'm reading my book and I'm, I'm super relaxed. So it's having a nighttime routine, but also understanding how your natural circadian rhythm works. Um, if you're not getting some kind of sunlight or some kind of light in your eyes, first thing in the morning, it's going to mess with your natural circadian rhythm. And so what I recommend is if you are in a place like for us, I had to learn this the hard way in Seattle is during those darker months. Like I have my, I don't have it around me now, but my little happy light, you can get them off Amazon. And it's basically just a, a UV light that you can shine in your eyes first thing in the morning. So your eyes get used to seeing that light. Um, so you want to make sure you're getting some kind of light. Uh, what is cortisol manager? Uh, I'm explaining that in just a sec. Good question. Um, so I'm going to explain that next. So here we go. So just so you understand, cortisol and melatonin are, are on opposite. They oppose each other, right? So if cortisol is high, melatonin is low. Meaning if I get a cortisol kick before I go to sleep, I'm going to be awake. Melatonin is low. If cortisol is low, melatonin goes up. So they do this, right? So that's what we want. If you're getting that awakening feeling too early in the morning or two to four in the morning or right before you go to bed and you're just wide awake, it's because your cortisol level has gone up and we just need to balance that out. Limit screen time, light things that activate your brain at night. <laughs> um, I always laugh because um, and some of you can relate. My boyfriend is a night owl and I am not. <laughs> and he can fall asleep just like that. Like you just lay down and go to sleep. Whereas I'm just like, it all has to be like this perfectly calming, quiet thing with the lights down and not a lot of noise and don't talk to me a lot or ask me, you know, questions. Cause he likes to talk in, in bed and have great conversations. And I'm like, can we not do this? Like right at 10 o'clock at night when I'm trying to go to sleep, cause it activates my brain and then my brain will just chew on it. So it's figuring out a way to just kind of keep that brain like calm. So it's not kicking up into a higher gear. Um, it's why I like <laughs> the silly little romance novels that I read because I don't really care about them. They just, they're cute and they make me fall asleep. Um, magnesium glycinate um, is really good at helping calm your system. It's going to help calm your brain. Um, I really like it at night. You can take, I usually tell people start with like 140 milligrams. Um, you can work your way up to 500 milligrams. Um, my functional doctor, she makes me laugh all the time. She's like, you could take like 3000 milligrams, Jen. I'm like, let's not have people do that. Um, that's a little overkill. Um, but it's just a matter of finding the dose that works for you. I think for me, I have a combination one that I take and then I take glycinate. So total at bedtime is probably around 460 milligrams. And then cortisol manager. Um, I don't know if you have, if you have access to Amazon, um, you might be able to, to get this. Um, I don't know as far as Sweden, Francesca, if, if, if what you have access to, but it is an actual brand or an actual name of a, of a, of a supplement called it's cortisol manager. You can look it up and it's a good combination of, um, herbals that are, they calm the brain down. So it's got like ashwagandha in it. Um, it's got rhodiola in it. It's got, I think it's got L-theanine in it. Um, 
it's got a, a nice little blend of things that are going to help keep cortisol down, <laughs> not up. Uh, I have a lot of clients that when they first take it, they're like, oh, I'm taking that cortisol supplement. And I'm like, keep in mind, it's lowering cortisol, it's not raising it. Um, and so their, ad their adaptogens is what the word is, is, is it's full of adaptogens that are gonna help kind of calm your system. And I take one of those. If I'm super stressed, I'll take two, um, but usually I get away with one. And then if you are at a place where you're doing any kind of um, hormone replacement therapy, keep in mind that progesterone is your calming hormone. It's the one that is going to help you sleep. Um, there are different forms of progesterone. You can do an oral, you can do, um, I'm on a cream right now. I don't really like the cream. Um, those are the two main ones and you wanna take it at night because it does help you sleep. If you're new to HRT or not sure if you want to do HRT, you can experiment with evening primrose oil. Evening primrose oil is a supplement that you can find and get almost anywhere. I would start with a low dose and make sure that you do okay with it. Um, but it actually helps your body produce progesterone on its own. And that might help you, um, might help you kind of regulate some things and help you sleep a little bit better. I would, again, just start, if you choose to do that, I would start with a low dose because you just never know when it comes to these things, how your body's going to react. Cool questions. So we got here. Can you start HRT late in life? Yes, you can. So here's, here, yeah. loaded question. Yes. Yes, you can. Um, I always think of the HRT conversation, like politics, you've got like far right, far left, right? HRT is kind of like that. You've got very, very conventional medicine, people who quite honestly are not up to date on current research. And by current research, I'm talking about the last 15, 20 years. So it's not even like recent, recent. They're usually operating off of um, something called the Women's Health Initiative, um, which has been debunked years ago, um, but they will tend to say things like HRT isn't safe, there are too many risk factors associated with it, um, and sometimes they will say that the later you start in life, I think it's that 10 years post-menopause, that your risk factors do go up, and that is true. Ten, so you, there's like a 10-year post-menopause window, and your risk factors do go up by like minuscule amounts, minuscule amounts. And the reality is that all research shows, if you look, women who are in, in the perimenopause to menop uh, menopause phase, they don't die from breast cancer, which is kind of a weird thing to say, but hear me out. Estrogen protects your heart. Estrogen protects your brain. She protects a lot going on in your system. And so what most women don't understand is what the real risk is. Women die from heart disease. If you've ever paid attention to your lipid panel, as you go through perimenopause into menopause, you're gonna notice that, hey, how come I all of a sudden have a cholesterol issue? How come all of a sudden my lipids, I, you know, now my doctor wants me to put on a statin. I never had this issue before, right? It's because we, we are more at risk for cardiovascular issues. Women die from cardiovascular issues. Um, diabetes, heart disease, Alzheimer's. Estrogen helps in all of those. She protects against those. Your risk factor from dying from those things is far greater than your risk of dying from breast cancer. Um, and so it really is just a matter of educating yourself and figuring out what are the best options for you. Across the board, my clients all choose. My job is just to educate them. And one of the things that we'll talk about on Saturday is... Um, for those that do get started with me, um, I found this amazing woman who has this community and it's all things um, related to hormone replacement therapy, perimenopause, um, menopause, um, and, and factual stuff, latest research on like, here's what your options are, here are options for testing, here are options for practitioners. Um, and it's all fact-based so that you don't feel like you're getting like mixed messages on like what's safe and what's not. So that was a good question long-winded answer, but hopefully that helps. Um, any other questions? 
in regards to this. And then if you guys want, um, I will show you what the panel looks like that I recommend you ask for. Um, you may have a hard time getting your doctor to run it. I'll tell you which ones they'll run and which ones they typically won't. Um, questions, questions? Oops, I didn't want that. Uh, Jen? Yes. I'd like to say that, um, so there's more and more, uh, I've been listening to some pods and some things and uh, about HRT. If I, if I had known today, uh, like 10 years ago, I would definitely have started HRT, but mm -hmm. I had a very easy, uh, transition. And so I, I didn't do, in fact, I, I, I told, talked my mother into not doing HRT when she was having her problems mm -hmm. because the can of the cancer risk, which we now found out was not substantial at all. Right. But what you're saying is that, because what I heard was also that, but you have to work within that window to be able to, to, to take HRT, uh, H, H, HRT, right. Uh, because after that, you can get an increased risk of heart, uh, you know, heart problems. Whereas before you would sort of insulate your heart a little bit, but that's not the case. No, you and, and your risk factors for any of those issues that does go up slightly is like, minuscule so when you see people saying well your risk factors go up it's like yeah but it's like <laughs> it's like this when the benefits are like this yeah. um so i think it's really about and it sounds like you have done a lot of educating to yourself a lot of people um are afraid because they have family history of breast cancer or family history of heart disease and things like that and and it really is finding the right practitioner who does this this is what they do um, because most people, I can tell you a regular GP practitioner, even gynos, um, I've even had, um, endocrinologists that I've had to go head to head with where I'm just like, this is ridiculous. Like it's because they, they, they are not up to date on the, on the latest research. And again, by latest research, I mean, in the last 15, 20 years. Because what, I, what, and a follow-up question is what I think is happening is that because I didn't have a difficult transition, I didn't take enough care of myself. And I think that all the, I think this is a saying you guys have, uh, all the chickens are coming home to roost or something like that. Mm -hmm. Because it's it's now at this, at this age where I'm going, oh, wait, something, something is not right. Yeah. Um, yes. And I can tell you that I too, looking back, and, and this is somebody who deals with this, looking back, I would have started HRT sooner. And part of it is just this, um, <laughs> you and I talk like women love suffering, right? Like I had symptoms, but they weren't like hot flash based, right? They were fatigue, they were digestive, they were like all these little things that I went, oh, it's fine, like I can work through it, like it's fine, like, and I just kept going. And I can tell you that I bottomed out, bottomed out three years ago, and ended up going to my GP and had the most frustrating experience because um, she wouldn't even test it, refused to test my sex hormones um, and, and gave me crap about it. Um, and by that point, I was so deep in the hole that when we started to do HRT, what happens is those cells were so depleted that when we started to do even low doses of HRT, my body would not metabolize them. And because my gut was a mess, yeah, I, I had no way to metabolize them. So when we first started putting me on progesterone, I would get migraines and I, I'm not a migraine girl. I'm like, what is happening? And we had to lower my dose all the way down. Eventually we did go to evening primrose oil just to get it going again so that my body can metabolize it. And now here I am two and a half, three years later, and I'm on a low dose um, cream just because my body couldn't process it. So I get what you're saying. I would have started it way earlier way earlier just to get everything balanced before I got to a depleted state. So, but again, it's a personal thing. And some people do have an easier transition. I think it's great that, that you did. Um, but yes, it does have an effect on everything else. It's all fixable though. It's all doable. Um, any other questions before I bring up this screen, make sure there's none in the chat. Um, so I'm going to share with you the screen. So I work with 
a company called Merrick. I will say they don't do overseas, um, unfortunately. So we would have to find you guys something overseas. We could probably find something in, um, it's called the Pausing Together Community. Um, but this is the panel that I have my clients get. I think they also don't work with um, anyone in New Jersey just because every state has different laws. But this is what, this is the information that we need. Now, what a lot of practitioners will tell you is that getting tested doesn't matter because these numbers literally move at different parts of the day. And this is true. This is absolutely true. But what we're not, we're not looking at like one marker, one panel. We're looking at how those panels work together. And I'll try and give you an example as we go through. So when it comes to your sex hormones, we, we want to look at your total testosterone level, your free testosterone, your estradiol, sex hormone binding globulin, progesterone. And then these down here, like your LH, your FSH is always pretty telling. They'll use this to see how close you're getting to menopause. So the number, the, the magic number is 25 is, is typically where you're going to see that you go into menopause. And then also, of course, not having a period for a year. Um, I can tell you that I have a company that she, we're like, wow, this is cool. She's at 48 at her FSH, but she does still have a period once in a while. Um, it's just because her body is just so regulated that it's like every now and then it's just still forces a bleed out every once in a while. Um, so those are the ones that we want to take a look at. If you are in perimenopause, the, the estrogen and the progesterone won't matter so much because if you're in perimenopause and you're at a place where your periods are very erratic, like mine, the numbers aren't going to make, there's no sense to them. There, there really is no sense to them. It's really just about building them up to a certain level and making sure that they're not so completely out of whack. Um, if you are in menopause, post-menopausal, they are where they are. And so then the testing is helpful because the goal is to like build those back up over time. But I would say even in perimenopause, I look at all of these because they you wanna look at the ratios as how they're working together as well. Um, when it comes to your thyroid, most practitioners are just going to test for TSH. Um, so I'm going to give you the very simplified version of how thyroid stimulating hormone works. It actually starts in your brain and something called your hypothalamus. Um, I like to call the hypothalamus command control center. And so if you can imagine there's some dude up there. I, I always picture him like being the guy at the airport, right? And he's like watching all the planes come in and he's the guy that's making sure that everything lands safely and gets out on time. And that like, that's command control center. That's your hypothalamus. And then he's got this right hand guy called the pituitary gland. And he tells the pituitary gland, hey, send a message to this place, send a message to this gate, right? That's what the pituitary gland does. So the pituitary gland then sends a, a signal down your um, thyroid <laughs> lane, right, if you will. Um, and so it says, hey, we need more thyroid. And that is that thyroid stimulating hormone. So it stimulates, it doesn't do anything. It just stimulates hormone it's going to stimulate the growth of something called T4. Now, T4 is kind of like a storage hormone. It also doesn't really do a whole lot. Um, it just kind of is a storage thing. Now, that T4 will convert to free T4, and then it converts to T3 and free T3. Free T3, at the end of the chain, um, is your workhorse. It's the one doing all the magic. It's the one in control of your thyroid. So what can happen is your pituitary gland sends a signal, stimulate thyroid stimulating hormone, check. It converts to T4, check, converts to free T4. Ooh, maybe a little conversion problem. We're not converting that quite right. We convert to free T3, uh, there's a big conversion problem. So now we're not getting enough T3. That conversion to T free T3 starts to drop off as well. And then at the end of the chain, that cell says, we don't have enough thyroid. So it sends a signal back up to your hypothalamus and says, we don't have enough thyroid to do what we need to do. Send more thyroid. So it will send the signal down and you will continue to push more thyroid stimulating hormone, but your workhorse isn't getting what she needs. Here's the problem. If your practitioner is only testing for TSH and your TSH normals levels are normal, we don't know if your workhorse is working. Does that make sense, guys? That's why you'll hear people say, you have to test free T3 and free T4 because there could be an issue with the conversion. And most practitioners, if they give you 
um, any kind of medication. They are going to give you medication for, for the stimulation of TSH or possibly T4. Um, they don't always prescribe something that will help with the conversion to T3. And that's problematic because free T3 is your workhorse. Um, lipids, we want a full panel there because we want to see, like, sometimes you'll see um, your cholesterol go up, but then the others look normal and that's not super alarming. So we want to look at how they're um, working together. Your blood. Now this one is your lipids. Most of your doctors will run. TSH doctors sometimes will run if they think you, if they suspect you have a, a thyroid issue. Um, your CBC is pretty standard. So if they're running any kind of um, blood work, you want to do this fasting. It will also pull back your fasting insulin, which is always very telling, um, especially when we look at it with other things. Um, so they'll run a CBC. Usually this is going to show some kind of infection in your system. Um, the metabolic, which is your CMP panel, um, also that's pretty standard that they'll run. Um, albumin serum, like all of these, a lot of these have to do with your liver function. And so what we're looking at is sometimes I'll pull a, I'll pull a lab and I'll see like one is slightly off or something, but the others all look okay. And it's like, that's fine. But if you see certain markers hitting and it's like, this shows that this is off, this shows this is off, this shows this is off, and you start to pull them all together, it will start to tell a story, which is why we want to get testing. It's not just one, pa one um, panel that we're looking at. We want to look at the whole thing. Inflammatory markers. Um, the C-reactive protein is one of the best panels to get to look at your cardiovascular risk factor. So I do like always running that. I like to run vitamin D. Um, vitamin D actually needs magnesium. So a lot of times um, if somebody's short on vitamin D, we'll make sure that they're getting enough magnesium, especially if you're in a place that's not getting enough sun. Um, <laughs> vitamin D is pretty important because it also helps with sex hormones like testosterone and estrogen. And it's also vitamin C. If you're not getting enough vitamin D, you're going to be tired, right? So we want to take a look at that. Um, an iron panel. So these are the ones that I typically will have clients ask for. And you guys can, I'll try and scroll. <laughs> you guys want to screenshot that really quick. Um, these are the ones that I typically have clients ask for, or, or this is a, the actual test that I'll have my clients order. And they can, they don't have to go through a health healthcare provider at all. They can just go to their nearest lab and then they get sent the lab work and then they send it to me and I, I walk them through. Questions? Kind of threw a lot at you guys today. What questions do you have? Anything? All right. So I have a question. Yep. Uh, and um, uh, so I I have a good doctor in that sense that uh, I did a, a lot of tests and I've had thyroid problems before. So I get a um, long time ago now, but I get the TS4, but not the T3. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm I'm thinking I'm beginning to see a pattern. You expressed it very well before when you talked about you know your digestion and it being a problem that started earlier and so forth and so forth. And I'm thinking that it would be great if if you have uh, tips on anything here in Europe or anything. I mean I know a few things, but once again it's also a jungle out there of, of and they're all very expensive the tests. So you know. Mm -hmm. to find out what I should do. I, I know that I could ask my doctor to get a vitamin test too, to get a spectrum of that. Mm -hmm. I've done, I've done things for the liver and the cholesterol and everything. Most of the things look, look okay. But as I've said to you before, something is off because I'm tired lots of times, especially, you know, when, sometimes when I eat, I have, I have to go lie down. Yeah. Um, it could be what you're eating. It could be digestion. Um, there, there, there are certain markers that we would look at first. For me, I'm a lifestyle first person. I'm always going to look at the lifestyles and go, okay, like what is happening? So like if you, if you came to your like, Jen, like, I feel like I do okay. But then every time I eat, I'm tired. I would look at what you're eating, um, because that can affect how you feel. Um, I would look at, we would have conversations about your digestion. So I would always look at those first and then see if we can knock some stuff back into place. If we can't, then we start to look at panels and go, okay, is your vitamin D high enough? Um, keeping in mind that if, if you're not on HRT and you're postmenopausal and everything else looks really great, you're like, 
yeah, but my estrogen is in the, in the crapper, right? Estrogen is your vibrancy hormone. So then, and so is testosterone. And what most women don't realize is that, um, prior to perimenopause, the, the hormone, the sex hormone that is at the highest level for them is actually testosterone. <laughs> It's, it's less than, than what men have, but it is the hormone that we have the most of prior to perimenopause. Well, estrogen and testosterone are your vibrancy hormones. They give you energy, they give you vitality, they give you motivation. So then we go, okay, well, what do you want to do? Right. Do we want to try some natural things? Are there, are there things that we can try to start to boost that up? Can we do some lifestyle things? There's always options, but it's just figuring out like, number one, let's, let's balance those four insulin, cortisol, leptin, ghrelos, make sure those are in place, see where the body is at, and then go, all right, what else do we need to do? Does that answer your question, Francesca? Well, yes and no, Jen. There's like always more questions when you to hook you, when you, when you say things that it's like, oh my God, okay. So then, and then it opens another door and another door. And I'm like, Wow. Okay. So I'm, I'm, I'm hopeful, but a little overwhelmed. <laughs> yeah. Um, and I apologize. Um, it, it, it can, no, be, no, it's okay. it, it can be very overwhelming. Just know that it's, it's imagine it's just like going through grade school again, right? Like you show up in kindergarten and you think, Oh, I'm just going to have to color. And then all of a sudden they're giving you these rules. And then you're like, okay, I've got these down. And then you go to first grade and you're like, okay, well now I have to learn how to write and one, two, three and ABC. And you're like learning. And it always feels overwhelming the first couple of days. And if you were a first grader and some, some teacher came in and goes, hey, we're going to put you in the 10th grade class, you would 100% be overwhelmed. So what we want to do is make you a really good kindergartner. <laughs> Those are your four. Those are your, your basic four hormones. That is your leptin, ghrelin, insulin, and cortisol. That's kindergarten. Then we go, all right, let's get you to first grade. So it's step by step by step. So that part... I I think what I'm reacting to is the fact that I and I, I and I do believe a lot of other women too have gone about it all the other wrong way. It's it's like you come to a certain age and you're like, okay, so I'm this many kilos over what I need to be weighing that would be good for me and my health and my knees and so forth. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me go on a diet or let me go train more. Let me do when in fact what I've learned these days is that it is really an internal journey first. What is going on in the inside? And, and, and I really do believe that my body, as everybody's body, is, is doing their best with love to try and communicate with us. Mm -hmm. and, I'm, and, and my, my frustration is because I don't understand what she's telling me. Yeah. You, you will through time. You will okay. over time. Yeah. It is, I, I get it messages every day from clients who are just like, this happened and this is what this means, huh? <laughs> like, yeah. Or they'll go, I think it's either this or I think it's this. And then I did, right? Like you just become this detective. You're like, I think it might be this, right? Like, and you just start catching them. It's just a learning process. And, and in regards to feeling like I've just done it all the wrong way, I get that. And as frustrating as it is, stomp your feet and be mad. You can go out there and, and jump on Instagram right now and you're going to see damn near everybody telling you that you just, it all boils down to calories. Like that is what you've been taught. You go to your doctor, that's what they're going to tell you. This is what you have been taught. So be mad about it, but then get over it because you need that energy to take steps forward. And it's still fixable. This is all fixable. It really is. You just got to start taking steps in the right direction. That's it. Yep. Yep. So, all right, guys, any other questions? All right. So tomorrow, just to give you guys a heads up, um, tomorrow, and I'm going to tell you the time, tomorrow is Friday, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern. And we are going to talk about measuring success. I'm going to help you start to heal your relationship with your scale. We are going to talk about the difference between weight loss and fat loss. And then we're also going to talk about 
realistic timelines and how long is this going to take? We're going to talk about that too. And then if you guys want to mark your calendars for Saturday, Saturday will be our last call. It is going to be at 8 a.m. Pacific, 11 a.m. Eastern. I'm going to explain to you how to run an effective evaluation. What that's going to do is let you switch your brain to a more clinical place instead of a critical place. Our brain always likes to go to the things that didn't work. Um, so I'm going to teach you how to run an effective evaluation so you can keep it very clinical, just like I would look at your stuff and be very clinical. I want to teach you how to do that. We're going to talk about some of the areas that maybe you guys struggled with this week, and I'm going to give help you find some solutions uh, while you have access to me. Um, we're going to talk about what does success look beyond the challenge? Like, what are the next steps? So the first step is always to, to balance those hormones out, those four, right? So like, how do I know when I get to the next level? How, how do I know when I can boost my metabolism? Like, we're going to talk about how to put that all together. And then um, two things. Winners are going to be announced um, on Sunday. So you guys will, once everybody has a chance to get through Saturday and kind of log everything, I will go through and check everything on Sunday. I will announce the winners of the, of the drawing. Um, and then on Saturday, when, once we get through everything, we talk about next steps, that is when you will get more information, the invitation to work with me ongoing. Um, I do have a program. I will explain everything in it. There is going to be a bonus. Um, I will tell you up front because it is very high touch, which means that there's a lot of working one-on-one -on -one with me. I can only accept 10 clients this round. I've made space for 10 ladies. And what I'm going to do is release a bonus for the first three that sign up. Now, because you're here, if this is a no brainer for you, you just want the information, send me a message. Tomorrow, I will release that information to you prior to the call and that way you can at least look at it and see if it's a good fit. Then you guys can shoot me any questions you have. And that's how that will work. All right guys, that's it for today. I hope this was helpful. Um, if you haven't finished the challenge, you still have plenty of time. Um, and I will see you guys all back here tomorrow. We'll see you then.